Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for showing up at my talk. Um, I would like to first thank the organizers for this uh, nice workshop and also for giving me the opportunity to present uh, some of our results. Um, so I will be talking about um, time evolution of many body localized systems um, in 2D. Um, this is a work uh, that I did uh, in my group with Marcel and Jens Eichert. And then you can check out our paper here, which we posted on archive just last month. So feel free to um, ask questions, and I'm happy to have your comments. Um, so um, since we already had a lot of excellent uh, introduction and lectures on many body localization, I will not um, repeat it. So I, I will not like give an introduction to many body local localization. Instead, um, I thought I will take some time to talk about uh, tensor networks, which is the main workhorse that, I, that we use in our paper. Right. So this is uh, going to be the outline of my talk. Um, I would like to start like, by giving some like, basic introduction to tensor networks and projected entangled pair state. These are the two dimensional ansatz of tensor networks. And like in the previous talks, like most, like, uh, like you heard about matrix product states and so on. These are tensor networks for 1D. But now I want to like talk about tensor networks in 2D, which we call PEPs. And then I will discuss a little bit about like uh, just to build up like uh, some application of PEPs like in ground state calculations and then like in real materials and then like non-equilibrium and so on. So the, re the reason I want to spend some time here is um, first, um, uh, I will be using a lot of um, tensor network diagrams. So for those of you who are not familiar with tensor network diagrams, um, it's good like uh, to be on the same pace. And also, um, because I would like to show you some recent advances in PEPs, what PEPs has been capable of doing uh, in terms of all these hard condensed matter problems. Um, so once, like, I, once I like, give introduction to PEPs and so on, um, then I will like, jump to the main topic of this workshop, which is many body localization. And then I will show how one can introduce disorder in a translationally invariant infinite PEPs. So I'm talking about infinite PEPs, which means I'm going to target the thermodynamic limit. So, this is tricky because when you have an infinite PEPs, you have like, like you will have like, you will have like some period, but you will have some transnational invariance, which means your site is going to repeat over some periodicity. And how do I introduce this order in such an IPEPs? Um, and then I will present some of the results, and then we can discuss together um, the conclusions and all. Good. Um, so uh, let's talk about tensor networks briefly. So uh, what are tensor networks? So what are tensors? Like tensors are just like multidimensional arrays of complex numbers, right? So like to give some example, um, like uh, a scalar. A scalar is an example of a rank zero tensor because it has no index. So it's a rank zero tensor. But then you can think about a vector which has one index that's like a row or a column and that's a rank one tensor. Similarly, you can extend this to a matrix which has two indices, two indices, row in a column, and then you call it a rank two tensor. Similarly, you can define like more higher rank tensors and so on, right? Um, so these are just like tensors. Uh, so I have given examples of like, like, um, like specific real numbers, but they can be complex numbers like in general. So uh, in like, uh, but instead of writing like the tensors explicitly, what we do is we use tensor network diagrams instead. So instead of like writing them like, like this, I will just introduce pictures, right? So this is how it looks like. So for a rank zero ten tensors, I will just denote it by a ball. Right, so this rank zero tensor has no index, therefore it's just a ball without any legs. Now, if you think about a vector, which is a tensor with one index, I attach a leg to this ball. Right, so, that's, uh, so if you see a ball with one leg, then it is a vector. Similarly, I can denote a matrix with a ball with two legs, and then I can generalize this to higher rank tensors and so on, right? So this is just like my pictorial notation of my tensors. Um, so uh, once we have this pictorial representation, uh, one can then think about, okay, so what is this? Uh, okay, if you, this is like, if you look at it, this is just a matrix multiplication, right? So this is like two matrices, like, uh, which, uh, and like the common index is like, it is sum over J, this is in the Einstein uh, notation. Uh, but instead of writing like this, if I have my tensor network diagrams, I will just write it like this, right? So, so I just like take A, it has two index, I and J, I and J, B has two index J and K, so I just like join the legs together. It means they are being summed over. So now you can see the multiplication of two matrix gives you a matrix because now this resultant tensor has two open legs, 
with isometrics. Is so this is a nice way of visualizing things. Well, well, this is an easy example. Let me give you like something that is, let's look at this, all right? So like a tensor operation that involves more tensors, more legs, and so on. So if you, if you look at this, well, it's, it's a bit like difficult like to tell uh, what you get out of this, but instead if you introduce a tensor network diagram, I just write it like this. So I just join all the legs together that are common. So if you look at this the resultant tensor network diagram, you don't have to like, think twice, and then you can see that there is no open leg here, and therefore the result is going to be a scalar. So uh, this is like why we like to use tensor network diagrams. It's convenient, and it's, like, it's, it's intuitive, right? Um, yeah, but so far I have just like, sought what tensors are. These are just ways of storing numbers. There is no physics involved. There is no quantum physics, OK? Now let's, let's talk about a quantum many-body system. Let's, let, let's slowly get closer to the topic. Let's talk about quantum many-body system. Now, if I think about a quantum many-body system, I can write any quantum many-body state as the superposition of the product states of all the different configurations. Right? So if I have a qubit, in order to represent a qubit, I need two complex numbers. I need two complex numbers, right? So if I have two qubits, I, have, I need four complex numbers, and so on. So if I have like, a particle consisting of like n two-level particles, I'm going to need to store these complex numbers. And this is a tensor with n indices. And the number of these parameters, the number of complex numbers that is stored in this big tensor is of the order of p to the power n, right? So it scales exponentially with the number of particles. This is why quantum many-body system is such a hard problem. Um, so, like, just to give you an intuitive, like, uh, understanding. Yes, I will, I will, like, we will, we will, like, discuss this, like, um, like, later. Um, so, once we have this, like, tensor with, like, n indices, which scales exponentially with the number of particles, um, intuitively, what this means is that if I have a two-level system, like a spin half that can point up or down, and if I take a real like, material that consists of an Avogadro number of atoms, it means that I need 2 to the power, 10 to the power, 23, which is number larger than the number of atoms in the observable universe, right? So this is a big problem. So this is a big problem. So how do we get out of this? Well, luckily, uh, nature is kind in the sense that most of the Hamiltonians that we have in the Hilbert space, they satisfy certain properties like uh, nearest neighbor interactions, local interactions, and the ground states and the Low energy states, they satisfy the so-called area law, which means the entanglement entropy of such a state scales only with the boundary and not with the bulk. So the interesting thing is that tensor network states are precisely the states that satisfy area law. Tensor network states satisfy area law by construction. So these are very suitable answers for describing such uh, any body system because we don't have to explore the whole uh, exponentially large many uh, body Hilbert space, but rather we can just focus on this tiny corner, which is relevant for us. Good, so uh, tensor network. Um, what is tensor network? For me, it's just a network of smaller tensors, right? So instead of like writing this big tensor network with p to the power n, I just express it as a network of smaller tensors. So you can see that this one scales p to the power n exponentially, but if I express it as a matrix product state, which is like very well known, then it scales polynomially with the system size, right? So of course, like you have all heard about matrix product states, and like uh, there has been like a lot of talks uh, using MPS and so on. And matrix product state is like the most uh, famous and the most successful tensor network ansatz. And then you know that like DMRG is like it's like the most famous uh, matrix product state algorithm. And then DMRG can approximate ground states of gap, local, many-body, 1D systems, up to machine precision. This one? The, the, the point is that like, we don't need to uh, explore all the, uh, like, the whole Hilbert space, space contained in this p to the power n, but rather we can express it. This can be expressed, approximated with, a, inst instead of 
a big tensor, we can uh, approxi approximate it with a network of smaller tensors with very like, high accuracy. That's the point. So here it scales exponentially and it scales polynomially here. You can do that. I will, I will come, I will come, yes. Yes, yes, there is a way of like um, representing fermionic system. It's, uh, we can do it with tensor network very easily. Uh, we can discuss like about this. It's not a, uh, it's, it's one of the advantages of tensor network is that unlike quantum Monte Carlo, we don't have a sign problem. Right, so yeah, so DMRG, like it's very accurate and so on. And so there are like very, a number of excellent uh, review paper on tensor networks. So these are some of them. So uh, we have spoken a lot about like MPS and so on. Uh, the idea is like we want to go beyond DMRG and MPS, right? Because like we want to think about nature and like nature is not always 1D. I mean, we have to think about like 2D and 3D system. And what do we do now? Like um, what, how do we, what kind of tensor network do we use in such a scenario? This is why, um, I want to introduce what is known as projected entangled pair state. So it's a tensor network in 2D. It's a two-dimensional ansatz of tensor network. So you can think of it as an extension of matrix product state to 2D, right? So this is how like a uh, projected entangled pair state or PEPs look like. So the tensors sit on the lattice that you, you have in your system. So it could be a square lattice, a triangular lattice, or, or like whatever it is, okay? So like when I say PEPs, like for now, I will just like refer to the system, but PEPs can also be generalized to a higher dimension. Right, um, so as I said, like PEPs, it looks like they are just generalization of matrix product state to higher dimensions. And it like has very similar properties with matrix product states in the sense that uh, projected entangled pair state obey area law. So what I mean is that if you give me a PEPs and I cut the PEPs into two parts, then the entanglement entropy will scale with the boundary of my cut and not with the bulk inside. Um, and not just the area low, uh, projected entangled pair state can represent like exotic topological phases of matter and so on with very small bond dimension. Um, but the question is, is it just the extension of matrix product state or is it like more, is there more to like PEPs than MPS? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, it's, I mean, there is like the PEPs have certain properties that are very different from matrix product state. For example, PEPs can describe critical systems. So this is, some, this is a no-go for matrix product state because matrix product states are used for describing um, ground states of gap systems, right? So there's that obey, obey area law and so on. PEPs can describe critical system. And not only that, um, unlike matrix product state, contraction of PEPs is a hard problem. What I mean is that, let's say you have your quantum many-body state represented as a PEPs, but that's not enough. You want to be able to compute observables out of that, right? And for this, you need to contract these tensors at some point. And this is known to be a very hard problem. So you cannot, you cannot contract a PEPs efficiently and exactly. So it's, it's a very hard problem, actually. But um, luckily, uh, we have like approximation, accurate, accurate approximation schemes that can be used for PEPs contraction. For example, there is like something called the boundary MPS technique where you uh, take a matrix product state and then you use this matrix product state to approximate the boundaries of your PEPs from left, right, up, down, and so on. And then there is like the corner transfer matrix renormalization group, um, which approximate the corners of your infinite PEPs into some fixed point tensors. And then once you have them, you can compute the observables and so on. Well, well, if like the question is then like if PEPs is so uh, difficult to contract and so on. Uh, why bother, right? So why PEPs? So why, why should we be using projected entangled pair state or PEPs for 2D system? Well, there's like a lot of reasons and um, to cite some uh, reasons like, for example, the first one is that PEPs like other tensor network states, they go beyond mean field, right? Because uh, they are built on genuine quantum correlation. So you include genuine quantum correlation, so they go beyond mean field. And then as I said, when you have uh, tensor networks, you don't have a sign problem. So like one of the best technique, the quantum Monte Carlo, which people have been using, um, suffered a famous sign problem for fermionic and frustrated system, but PEPs do not have this problem, right? And the other thing is that PEPs can tackle large system size, including the thermodynamic limit. 
So this is like the other advantage of PEPs over uh, techniques such as exact diagonalization where it scales exponentially with the, with the number of uh, system size, right? And so with like uh, PEPs, as I saw, it scales only polynomially with the system size. And you can even, like, as I said, like, uh, target the thermodynamic limit by assuming some translational invariance. So like, there, there, there are several other reasons. Um, like, so these are some of the ones that I want to saw. Besides, like, for me, it's easier to draw pictures. Um, that's, that's, it just like, simplifies the problem. Yeah. Um, so uh, let me just give like, some like, uh, uh, quick uh, applications of PEPs, and then we like, uh, quickly move on to many-body localization and what we do. Um, so like PEPs or IPEPs, which is the infinite version of PEPs, they have been successfully employed to study really hard condensed matter problems, which, for example, is the ground state of the kagome heisenberg antiferromagnet, which is one of the hardest problems in condensed matter physics. The ground, the, like, there's no consensus on the nature of the ground state of this kagome heisenberg antiferromagnet. And by using PEPs, uh, we have been able to like, provide like, very good um, ground state energies that suggests like gapless quantum spin liquid and so on. And the other example is uh, PEPs have been able to obtain the lowest ground state energy for the DOP 2D Hubbard model. This is considered a holy grail for high temperature superconductivity, and like PEPs has managed to beat the best state of the art quantum Monte Carlo techniques uh, uh, in terms of the ground state energy. Right. So these are just like um, applications of PEPs recently uh, for ground states. Uh, for these are paradigmatic models like Hubbard model, Kagome Heisenberg antiferromagnet, and so on. But then one can think about like real materials, right? We can think about real materials. So these are some of the things that we are doing in the group. So this is like a new quantum magnet that the experimentalist, experimentalist discovered, calcium chromate. Uh, the experimentalist found evidence of a gapless quantum spin liquid. Um, so you see this is quite a complicated uh, lattice structure. It consists of two layers of breathing Kagome lattice. And we were able to confirm uh, experimental evidence of spin liquid behavior in this actual material. Um, not just that, um, PEPs can be used for finite temperature 2D states. So recently we designed an algorithm that starts by cooling down, uh, an annealing algorithm that starts by cooling down an infinite temperature, temperature state to the ground state, to the zero temperature. And with this, we were able to study the finite temperature phase diagram of the 2D bose hubbard model. Um, this is something that has been done only with quantum Monte Carlo so far, but we have been able to look at that. And not just that, uh, we have also use PEPs to study open dissipated 2D system. This is when your system is not isolated and when it's interacting with some environment and how do you tackle such system. Now you don't have a Schrodinger equation, you have a master equation and you have to deal with it. Um, so we, we, we proposed an algorithm using PEPs and it was also the first technique that included genuine 2D quantum correlations um, to study such kind of 2D dissipative system. And with this, we were able to settle many of the controversies regarding the a steady state phase diagram of dissipative icing model, XYG model, and so on. Right, um, yeah, so like besides all these things, uh, very recently we started using PEPs for quench dynamics. So as you can see, there has only been three papers so far, which all came out this year, and this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Right, so um, that was like a brief introduction to uh, the technique that I'm using and some applications. So if, uh, there, if you don't have any question, I will like move to this next section on many body localization. Right, um, right. So let's first uh, talk about a model that we have. So we consider a 2D interacting Hamiltonian. So this is like here I return in terms of this and you can see that this U is uh, the one that controls the interaction. So when u is zero, you can map this problem to a free fermion problem, and you can solve this almost analytically. And that's when you have like Anderson localization and so on in 2D. Um, but we are interested in the interacting regime, that is when u is very strong, right? So um, for the rest of my talk, I will consider u equal to one, okay? So strongly interacting regime. Okay, now uh, once we have this 2D interacting uh, Hamiltonian, we want to add like disordered field. We want to see like the dynamics uh, with disorder, right? So th usually the way like we add disorder would be you take this interacting Hamiltonian and then you add some random on-site uh, magnetic field, right? 
And this, like, uh, the strength of this random on-site magnetic field, you can draw it randomly from a continuous interval. So I will call this a continuous disorder because I draw it from a continuous interval. It means that this h can be any real number between minus h and h, right? So I call it a continuous disorder. So now I want to use an alternative approach to implement this order in a translationally invariant setting. Because if you look at this, you want this uh, value of hi to be different at its side, right? So this obviously you cannot do it if you have like the same tensors everywhere or if you have a translational invariance. So you need to find a way to circumvent this problem. And how do we do that? Um, I will introduce this uh, mechanism now. And this was first introduced for the first time in like 2005 how to use like disorder uh, for translational invariant setting. And it has been used in 1D system and more recently um, like in 2D. Okay. Okay, so uh, how does the protocol proceed? Let's look. First, uh, the initialization. How do I initialize my states? Uh, first of all, I take an initial state that I can write as a translationally invariant IPEPS. My IPEPS is always going to be translationally invariant because I have a I have a thermodynamic limit that extends everywhere. So I take an initial state, which can be written as an IPEPS. Um, for example, you can take the new state where all the neighboring spins are pointing in opposite directions. Now you can see that uh, there is, this is a product state, right? It's a, it's a new state, it's a product state. There is no entanglement. Um, but now I have to introduce an auxiliary state. Okay? I introduce an auxiliary state. This is a product state of equal superposition states. So I introduce a new state, which I call pi A, and it's still a product state, uh, but they're all in equal superposition states. So if, um, if the size of my auxiliary state, the local dimension of the auxiliary state is two, you can consider like plus to be equal superposition of zero and ones, right? So yeah, so I introduce two states. The physical state, this is where I will be check, like studying the dynamics and an auxiliary state. And then number C, I take their tensor product. So I take the tensor product. So to make it more clear, I will like represent it with my tensor network diagrams like this. So this is my physical state. So you see that this is a new state because like the two sides, like they alternate with like different directions. And then I have an auxiliary state and all the sides are the same, like plus, 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 right? And you can see that like this a psi P, psi naught P and psi naught A, they are all product states, which means there is no entanglement between any of the sides. So I take their tensor product now. As per this protocol, I take their tensor product and this is still in a product state. Okay. Now, um, once I prepare my initial state, now I need to do the quants, right? How do I do it? Um, I need to change my Hamiltonian a little bit. So this was the original Hamiltonian that I introduced like for the continuous disorder, like with like and so on. Uh, but now I need to change my Hamiltonian as follows. So let's look at this um, Hamiltonian carefully. So the, there is like spin-spin interaction between like the physical sides. So the P here means the physical sides. A means the auxiliary sides, right? So you introduce like spin-spin interaction between all the physical sides, but you don't do anything to the auxiliary sides, right? Because they're not relevant. But finally, you add a second term, a classical interaction between the physical spin and the auxiliary speed for one particular side, right? This is, in fact, the term that injects this order from the auxiliary state to the physical state. So this is the term that is responsible for the discrete disorder. And by changing the dimension of my auxiliary state here, I can increase the number of levels of my discrete disorder. Right. So once I have this Hamiltonian, uh, modified Hamiltonian that acts on like this separate Hilbert space, I can do the quench with the modified Hamiltonian starting from my original initial state, which is this, right? Again, I will not like discuss like how I specifically do this quench because I think it's a bit too technical uh, like for this crowd. Um, but one can do this and you can ask me if you have questions on this. So yeah, I do the time evolution and I generate my time dependent state using this. Um, so once I have my states, my dynamic states, what do I do? I need to be able to uh, obtain information, I need to be able to read out, right? So what this means is that I want to compute expectation values of local observables. Again, I'm not showing the details of how to compute the expectation values. It is actually, um, as I said, like quite a, like it involves, it's, it's quite involved and you need to take, there's like uh, uh, algorithms and so on in order to do this. 
but then I don't show it again. I mean, this is, this is apparent because if you want to compute expectation values, you have to take this like peps and it's like the cat and the bra and then you have to do the sandwich and you have to contract these two tensors like that extends like indefinitely in all directions, right? So this is obviously a hard problem. I don't show it here. But then again, you see that if I compute the expectation value with using such a protocol, uh, like the expectation value of this observable O, um, which like you obtain by acting with the unitary and which can be separated into the auxiliary and the physical state, then I obtain this observable. But what is interesting is that this is already the disordered average. This is already the average over all the disorders, right? Because I am taking into account all the auxiliary states that are in a superposition. So the, 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 the good thing about this, uh, this technique is that, first of all, it circumvents the problem of adding disorder in a translationally invariant setting. So you have a way to get around adding disorder in a translationally invariant setting, but also you avoid taking multiple sorts of disorder configurations. The way you would usually do it with continuous disorder is that you would take one sort, computer dynamics, take another sort, you do it like multiple number of times, and then you take the disorder average. You don't have to do this anymore. Uh, this is already the disorder average. Perfect. Yeah, so like this is this is the uh, this is like this is the protocol and protocol complete. So we know how to initialize, we know how to do the quens, and we know how to do the readout. Okay. So there is like a classical interaction of GG, but like apart from that, there is no interaction. Because like um, at some point, like when you uh, take the sandwich of this and this, they have to disappear. Yes, yes, yes. We have a like a classical interaction that we put. Right. Okay. So th th that was that was the technique that um, I use. And now I'm I'm going to like show you my results in this uh, uh, ten minutes. Like uh, results. Okay. So first, let's look at the quens without disorder. Okay. So this is. Oh, it's not. Yes, like you are, you are acting with the, like the modified Hamiltonian on the auxiliary state, of course. It, it acts on the product state of the physical state and the auxiliary state, but. Well, uh, well, okay, fine. What I mean is that like the disorder term is not explicitly dependent on time. Okay. So what do you mean by disorders being? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this already takes into account all the possible configurations. So you, it is, it, it is evolving as a function, like, of course, it is evolving as a function. Hmm? Okay, so I think I'm like, not able to. Okay, so, um, so this, this like, let me first result, present the results without disorder. So this is like, obviously on the, on the ergodic side. Um, yeah, so this is like, the, I compute the particle number at the two st uh, states starting from a nil state, so obviously the particle numbers like this are zero and one, at time t equal to zero. Um, so these are the two plots, and this delta t is the trotter step that I use, uh, just to make sure that they are consistent with small trotter steps and so on. Um, so you see that I am able to go to very, like, very short time dynamics, but this is not a surprise because we are dealing with like, strongly interacting, like uh, ergodic system and 2D. Um, so, but, like, but then you see that, uh, as I do the, the as I do the quens, um, it tends to it looks like the particle imbalance will like go to zero, but I cannot like go to much longer time step, and I cannot um, predict. Uh, I cannot like very say very strong conclusion uh, based on this. Um, so I stop my time evolution at like some like 0 0.8 times the hopping parameter. Um, so how do I determine the criteria for stopping my time evolution? That's uh, something that we should consider. Uh, this is why I compute the Rennie entropies of the reduced density metrics of the subsystems. So what I do is that as I do the quens, I compute reduced density metrics of subsystems. 
and then at some point they will become maximally mixed, right? So when they become maximally mixed, this is like kind of a signal that your global state is becoming maximally entangled, right? So I don't want to go to the state that is maximally entangled because, because like I, I cannot do the evolution anymore. So this is why um, I stop my time evolution when the uh, entropy, the Rennie entropy goes close to one. This is one because I have rescaled it to its maximal value. So if I have a two-level system, then my maximal Rennie entropy is going to be just log two, right? So this is like scale with that. And so like as soon as it starts approaching its maximal value, I stop my time evolution. Right? And here is just like the truncation error because when you do uh, tensor network, uh, uh, the bond dimension grows. And obviously you have to truncate the bond dimension at like, uh, like systematically. And then this is like how much weight I throw out, right? And then you also see that this is like quite uh, under control. Yeah, um, yeah, so the, yeah, so this is like the plot without a disorder. And now let us look what happens when we add small disorder. This is, I will first start like adding small binary disorder, which means that my auxiliary state has only two states. And it also means that my disordered field can take only two values. So here, let's say it can take only one and minus one. So this is what I mean by binary disorder. So um, you can see that as soon as we add like small binary disorder, um, our time evolution, we can extend it, it has been extended, right? So we are able to go from 0 0.8 to 1.2. And then you can also see that the entanglement entropy, the growth of the entanglement entropy kind of slows down. See like a remarkable slowdown in the entanglement entropy. Right, this is uh, still a uh, binary disorder uh, with small disorder strength. Uh, but then you can already see the change in the behavior that like uh, when you add disorder, um, the particle number uh, like becomes like this, but uh, there we still don't see any like signatures of localization or anything. So we thought that, well, one, the way if one, we want to see localization, we either have to increase the disorder strength, but also we need to increase the number of levels of disorder. Right, because here the disorder field can take only two values and that's not disordered enough, let's say. So we need to take like more levels of disorder. This is what I saw in the next uh, figure. Here this is uh, for different levels of disorder. You can see I started with a binary disorder that had a local dimension two. Now I, if I increase the local dimension to three, four, five, and six, then you can see like the behavior of the particle number, it like becomes to saturate, so on and so on. And at around particle like local, uh, I mean like six levels of disorder, you can already see that the particle imb imbalance is kind of staying fixed and non-zero. And in all this, uh, we like keep our Algorithm and dynamics under control that this is still the truncation error. It's still very small and What we see is that we kind of say that we have signatures of localization in higher levels of disorder So if I say If I increase like the limit of the a the local dimension of the auxiliary state going to infinity is like the continuous disorder state continuous disorder chaos, right and so by just like by just increasing the number of levels of your disorder, you can like see like strong localization behavior, and in the limit of like this level going to infinity and the disorder strength going to infinity, you can kind of like expect that the particle stays frozen to their initial configuration, which is like very strongly localized. Well, so I've um, given only like some like uh, plots. Um, there's like uh, we have like more plots in the paper where we have some interesting results on the non-interacting case, which for some reason we don't see signatures of localization in the Anderson case with discrete levels in 2D, uh, but um, um, I don't discuss them here. So this like, talk is just about the interacting case and many body localization. Yeah, so um, that's it. Um, yes, um, I'm done. All right, so this, this is the, these are like some brief results that uh, I wanted to show you. Um, yeah, so then let's just like go to the summary. 
uh, the summary is that um, we I have shown that like I have like shown you that tensor networks are state of the art powerful numerical tools for describing quantum many body states, and like two to the two dimensional tensor network ansatz that are known as projected entangled pair state, uh, and they have been employed in a wide range of like uh, difficult condensed matter problems, and then I like use like how I showed how to use infinite projected entangled pair state to study the dynamics of 2D disordered systems. And then you can add discrete disorder in such a translationally invariant setting by introducing this auxiliary state that I discussed. And if you combine all these techniques, you can see evidence of many body localization emerging in 2D um, for systems with many levels of disorder. Right. Um, so like um, some, some of the outlooks that we want to, some of the things that we want to see is probably like look at the precise interplay, like more precise study of the interplay of the disorder strength, disorder level, and the system size when you do this on a finite system and so on. And of course, as we discussed in the previous lectures, there's a lot of open question about MBL transitions and everything that's open in 1D stays open in 2D, um, all these open problems. And then we, uh, we think it's, it will also be kind of interesting to like think about experimental implementation of this kind of uh, programmable disorder, which I would like to call because they are not truly random in that sense, without using like trap ions and superconducting qubits. Yeah, so I would like to uh, thank my collaborators, uh, Jens Eichert and Marcel Goyle from um, FU Berlin, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Maxim. Okay. Uh, in some cases, I believe it's important uh, to access uh, observables uh, that are beyond just expectation values. For example, if you do some sort of Loch echoes uh, and uh, average over disorder uh, signal, you're not going to gain any information about MBL. You will gain some information about, uh, roughly speaking, you'll do some transform of a uh, distribution of your disorder and it's going to be the same in Anderson or MBL but if you access fluctuations of the signals then you can convincingly tell between many body localization and uh, Anderson so is this technique capable of uh, measuring and averaging let's say entanglement or any other quantities right because then it's non-trivial right the kind of averaging over disorder of all possible entanglements that would be very non-trivial quantity, but is it capable of doing it or no? If you, I mean, if you are talking about like uh, like computing um, entanglement quantities. Yes. Yeah, so, so can can with this same technique you obtain S of t averaged over all possible disorderizations? Yeah. So I saw like uh, like the computation of the Rennie entropies. That, that that would be again. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other question. Uh, so can you show again what was the evidence of many body localization in, in, in 2D? Now it's, uh, so what, what was this system size? Uh, so I'm not sure. No, the, the system size stays infinite. Huh? System size, we have a translationally invariant IPEFs. So the system size, we are directly in the thermodynamic limit. So what I'm increasing here is the uh, levels of disorder that I put. Yeah, but yeah, yes. there should be something that effectively plays a role of the system. I mean, you cannot. Uh, yes, yes. So, so, that, so, that, so, so, so then maybe the question. So, so what? That, so that's, uh, that's so where do you, what does play a role of, of the system size? Yeah. What, so that's that's what I mean by like what I put also in the outlook, like a precise interplay of the system size and the level of disorder um, should be quite um, like that's something that we want to do. Yes, yes, so like the system side is kind of determined by the, like the bond dimension, I would say, of my tensor network. And you can do some kind of like, if you go this to infinity, then yeah. Yeah, and so, so there's, but can you say so now, what is, in some sense, well, I don't know how to formulate it, should be something playing the role of the, uh, uh, of the, so, active system size, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure how to, how to formulate like, this question, uh, but it's, uh, I mean, like a way of like looking at the effective correlation, like yeah. length of such an infinite perhaps would be to look at this by increasing like the bond dimension and so on. 
And what would be the, what would be the, I just want to try to understand characteristic values of this, and I'm not sure okay, which, so like, which number I should think I look my, at. My, my intuition is that if I increase the, the bond dimension, then I will be like able to go to larger times in my evolution, but I don't think it will change like uh, localization. So, so we know that in, in, in B also when we, when we try to solve sort of uh, finite systems, we have a huge uh, finite size effect. Yeah, that's uh, for, mm -hmm. so there is a, in one d where we know that there is a transition as discussed here and that's uh, so uh, my guess it should be something that plays the same role here but i'm not sure where where, where they are i mean like uh, as, as i said like the precise interplay of the finite system size like in that sense like an like explicitly finite system size when you don't take an ipeps instead of a finite peps and then studying uh the effect of this system size with a disorder strength that is something that we want to do but if you look at our paper, um, we have some finite size calculation for the Anderson case. Um, maybe like that gives you like more. Yes. So I only saw it here for the. Anything else? Um, so I I saw that the characteristic feature of localized states would be that the entanglement would remain pretty low. Uh, so in that sense, even if time, that you could go to longer time for localized states than, than the other one. Is that something you observe? Yes, um, so I did not like put in the, like the Rennie entropy here, but like, uh, yes, yeah, so if you go to like longer time, the entanglement uh, kind of stay constant. I mean, uh -huh. like it should like propagate very slowly, but then there are other like numerical uh, inaccuracies like that is coming up due to the truncation and so on when you go to longer time. So it is not true that you can push your simulation for longer times at higher value of the disorder. Um, I will have to increase my like with like higher bond dimension and so on. I think like we can. Anything else? Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.